Our first reading today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 24, verses 12 through 18. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there. I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up onto the mountain of God. To the elders, he had said, wait here for us until we come back to you. Look, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the Israelites. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Our gospel reading today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I'm beginning to wonder if 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 Kino isn't just getting way more comfortable. Ah, uh, is he? <laughs> Michaela said he's getting obnoxious. All right. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As you probably well know, our building is full of kids Monday through Friday. When I come in at any point during the day, I am astounded at the noise and the joy and the giggles that I experience. It's one of my biggest joys that most of the time, most days I need to walk through a sea of children to get anywhere. Sometimes it's even getting outside the door of the office, but it's almost always when I'm trying to, to communicate with ARC staff and, and, and have to go through it all, right? I love to see them playing and singing and moving. And I have to tell you, my inner five-year-old loves it when they get to play with the parachute. Did you ever have that experience in school with the parachute? Oh man, we had a parachute, but we only got to play with it like once a year. 
And so when I see them getting to play with it, I'm like, oh, they get to play with it. Thank you. Anyway, the, 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 the thing about the, the th when I walk through the arc is that most of the time the kids are involved in their own world. I could be there or not. There, I'm just another obstacle between them and the playground or them and their choice. I'm just another one of those sets of legs or adults, right? They're, they're, they're focused on the art project in front of them or the story they're being told or, or the pedals on their tricycle. But here's the thing. And then there are those moments when they are not in their own world. When they join me or notice me in this world. When maybe I'm something different, something they don't understand. I loved it the other day. I was out on the playground helping a, uh, somebody look at some things in our backyard. And, and um, one of the kids yawns up and he goes, who the heck are you? Made the teacher laugh too, right? And, and, and sometimes their questions are more than who are you? What's your name? And, and why are you here? And, 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 and all those kinds of questions. I'm reminded in those moments that kids ask why a lot. Actually, let's, let's change that. People ask why a lot. We just get better at it as we get older. We don't just go, why? <laughs> right? Why is the sky blue? Why do I have to go to bed? Why, why, why? I'm sure you could, a few why questions just popped into your mind, right? And sometimes we have answers for those questions, right? Like, like that the beautiful sunset is a result of light reflecting off of dust and moisture in the air. And sometimes, even we as grown ups don't have answers and we are left in wonder and awe. There are lots of things we wonder about and are unsure about. And this morning's passage might be one of them. This morning's passage from Matthew is a, is, 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 is a wonderment. And even our passage from Exodus this morning is a wonderment. What happened on those mountains? Why do we still talk about those experiences? This morning in the liturgical year is a pivot point, a liturgical liminal space between Advent and Christmas and Epiphany and Lent, which begins this Wednesday with Ash Wednesday and eventually Easter. We are in this, this morning we pause between the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000 and heading to Jerusalem. We pause with Jesus on a mountaintop with his closest confidants to reflect on what is, upon who Jesus is. So for Peter and James and John, the normal Jesus, the everyday Jesus, they have come to expect. The one who wears clothes just like they do, the one who eats bread and, and sleeps with, they, they, they move and travel and watch heal and perform miracles. That one, that Jesus is transformed before their eyes. In other okay. words, the That's guy cool. they knew or think they knew completely and well as anybody can know somebody else Absolutely. is transformed before their very eyes. And a voice from heaven says, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Now, we talk a lot about where we're putting ourselves in the story, right? And I think it's pretty clear where we, we, where we would be in this story. We're not Jesus. We're much more like Peter and James and John, right? We're going to be observers of this thing, right? We're, so, so put yourself on that mountaintop and see what they saw. 
If you were there and you saw what you saw, you probably would be terrified too. Because when was the last time one of your best friends started glowing? The last time I saw that, it was a cartoon and they had been exposed to nuclear energy. <laughs> not a good situation, right? Like this is not how it is supposed to be. And you know, those tangible evidence of, of healing and feeding and and those things that they were seeing Jesus do and, and that were happening in his midst, those had a little bit more, hmm, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Tangible reality or tangible hmm, effect, right? When someone's healed, you see the transformation. When somebody's fed, there's no, the, the hunger disappears. But this miracle, this miracle, you don't know where it's going. You don't know why it's there. You don't know what it's for. You probably would be terrified and at the very least mystified. And you would at the very, very least ask why. Us humans, we want to categorize and rationalize, and we want to make sense. Hence, Peter's notion to build up some booths and tents. We don't want to, we want to, we, we want a dust and particle, dust particles and moisture type of answer, right? And on this case, there isn't one, right? And so Peter, Peter does the thing, right? He's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll make it, we'll make it make sense. This is a place of worship. And we're just going to create that here. See, I think we are reminded by Peter in this story that trying to make sense of the transfiguration will blind us to the important parts of this story. As Matthew tells Jesus' story, he's intentionally setting and connecting Jesus' story with Moses' story. We cannot peel the two apart. Moses, Matthew is, is reminding us of, 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 of how, what Moses did for the people and where Jesus is leading the people. There are many parallels. Did you hear them in the story? I didn't even connect this morning until this morning, the six days. That the, the Jesus's transfiguration happened six days after the feeding of the 4,000. And Moses went up and had to wait six days on the mountain for his experience. I love, I love those little, those little things, right? Those little, those little nods that sometimes we don't, we don't always catch, right? But the connections are, are clear, right? Like there's a holy mountain and a voices from heaven and, and clouds and fire. And even Peter's suggestion of those, those dwellings or those booths bring to mind the, the festival of the booths when the people, when the Jewish people live outdoors in booths to remember that the that time that the people wandered in the desert. And it isn't just Jesus, Moses' story that we're reminded of. It's not just the, the way of, of weaving that in, but also Jesus' story, right? Because when have we heard those words before? When have we heard, this is my son, the beloved, right? It's at, at Jesus' baptism, at the beginning of the ministry, just before he goes into the wilderness to wrestle with Satan over what it means to be the son of God. And we have this affirmation right after Jesus has had this interaction with Peter. Remember where, P where Peter's, where Jesus is talking about his suffering and death. And Peter says, oh, no, 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 that can't be how it happens. Oh, no, 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 no. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You know, there's this temptation to think. There's this temptation to think that 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 we that we do it once and we're done with it, right? 
And here's Jesus reminding us that we're going to come up, up against these things again and again that we struggle with. We're going to have those echoes of the desert experiences and the echoes of the mountaintop experiences. In this liminal time we have in this story this morning, this time away on the mountain with Peter and James and John, with that cloud and that Jesus glowing with hol holiness and glory and Moses and Elijah there chatting with him and Peter and James and John shrinking back in awe and wonder and fear. We also have this moment where Jesus touches them, where Jesus touches them and lets them know that everything is okay. My inner preschooler goes, why do we have this? Why is this so important? And I think it's paradoxically, the answer to that question is paradoxically found in Jesus's admonition to keep quiet about what they have seen. I think that always hits us weird, right? Why can't they tell the story? Why are they instructed so often to keep quiet? You know, Jesus says, don't tell anybody until the son of man has been raised from the dead. It's a weird thing, right? Have you ever tried to tell your friends an unbelievable story? Have you ever tried to convince them that something that happened to you really happened to you? And everybody goes, yeah, right. Yeah, right. That's what Jesus is talking about here, right? You have had an experience that will not have context and meaning for anybody else until something else happens. And they can come and meet you there. Healing and casting out demons and feeding thousands makes sense. Transforming, keep it to yourself. Until, until after the resurrection, when this story becomes another piece of evidence about who Jesus was and is and who what God is up to. The story of the transfiguration then becomes part of the, the long story of God reaching out to us, reaching out to all of us with love and compassion and mercy. You see, the why may not be the, quite the, 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 correct, the correct question. What happens in the transfiguration is that we are given a lens to look at life, at life, to look at our lives at ourselves, and when we take a good look in the mirror, when we realize that those things that we have experienced have transformed us, right? Sneaks up on us sometimes, doesn't it? Oh, we just lost everybody on Zoom. Just a second. All right, we're back. Those things sneak up on us, right? Those, those transformations, right, are, are subtle sometimes. Or they're grand, and then we have to figure out who we are again, right? But, but when we take a good look at ourselves in the mirror, we can, and, and, and a good look at our, at, at our life, right? At, our, at, the, at the, the ways that we have been moving and the ways that we have been experiencing, we can find ways that we have been changed, where we have been transfigured by the presence of the holy in our lives. Now, it might not be that big dramatic change, right? I'm not going to, okay, probably won't go blind, blonde overnight. Should never say never, but, right? But, 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 but there, and it probably won't look like shining like Jesus or involve clouds coming over us for an extended period of time. But we will have changed because of having Christ in our lives. If we look at ourselves in the mirror, 
hopefully we will be less selfish and more generous, less judgmental and more tolerant, less anxious, more trusting, do fewer self-destructive things and do more constructive things. We might look back on our relationship with God and see the ways that we have been transfigured, smoothed out, reshaped, formed in the image of God. And perhaps, yes, glow in that, metaph in that metaphorical way that becomes attractive and, and, and enticing that people want that kind of life. We are called to tell the story of our encounters. When the time is right, it might not be the moment it happens, right? But the time may come. The time will come when God calls us to remind one another how we are loved and how we are beloved through those experiences that we have of transformation and change. So this morning, as we worship, I remind you to look deeply into the mirror, to look deeply at those around you and see the transfiguration that God is about in and through and among us. Amen. Amen.